My name is Matt White. I am the uh, CEO and founder of a small uh, outfit called Berkeley Synthetic, uh, working at the intersection of simulations and uh, AI. Um, I am the co-founder and chair of the Open Metaverse Foundation. Open Metaverse Foundation, a part of the Linux Foundation, uh, but was originally founded back in 2006. And I'm a board director and chair at the Metaverse Standards Forum. So what is the metaverse? Uh, you may all recall uh, Justice Rehnquist's uh, famous statement on, on the metaverse here. And I don't know if anyone wants to take a stab at uh, trying to define what the metaverse is or will be. No brave souls? All right. So I don't know what the metaverse is either, to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> but there are a few things that I do know. Uh, I think the metaverse uh, does not yet exist. And there are some core tenets that I think we have to, to be cognizant of and follow uh, in, in building out a shared simulation, right? And so uh, some of the obvious things here are that we need interoperability uh, to be able to facilitate communication and movement through virtual worlds. Uh, we need persistence, so the ability to maintain state and, um, you know, create this global shared simulation that is fairly frictionless. And we need to support the creator economy. We need to support an economy that uh, moves in and out of the metaverse that empowers creators um, and its users. And then immersive experiences, I mean, that is you know, fundamentally the foundation of the metaverse, whether that is a game, whether it is a uh, you know, a scientific experiment or a virtual laboratory or a training gym for autonomous agents. Um, we need these immersive experiences. Also, it's, it's social. Uh, I've seen several definitions of the metaverse that completely exclude that, which is bizarre to me, but um, it certainly needs to be a social space. And uh, of course, it should be accessible and, and inclusive, right? It should be a space that is safe for everyone to participate in and, and be inclusive across the board. Um, so I don't think it makes sense to define what the metaverse is or will be. I think what it what makes sense as, as builders of the metaverse is to take the bottom-up approach, right? And so build the underlying infrastructure, allow developers and creators to build their experiences on top of an interoperable framework. Um, and, and the metaverse will then define itself. So at the Open Metaverse Foundation, we have eight uh, foundational interest groups. We've fundamentally divided these up into areas that we believe will uh, be catch-all basins for uh, most of the activities. And, and certainly we um, you know, may change that with time, but we have these eight foundational interest groups. Uh, Networks, I mean, these are all fairly intuitive, but I'll go through them quickly. Uh, so networks, this is how we move um, between virtual worlds. This is how uh, the virtual, virtual worlds are interconnected and, and how we can do things like uh, state management, um, naming and addressing these sort of fundamental elements that have significant parallels in, in the internet today. Um, we have users, so this is like decentralized ID, wallets, uh, you know, ident uh, authenticity of users and that, and that sort of thing. Um, then we have legal and policy. So, you know, we're, we're trying to be very cognizant of the fact that this can't be a, a lawless space, right? The metaverse needs to have guardrails, it needs to have bounds, and uh, so we are looking at, at that as well. And certainly, just like, uh, you know, policy will start to affect uh, artificial intelligence, it will eventually uh, find its place in the metaverse. Then we have virtual worlds and simulations. So these are the engines that, that run the virtual worlds. Uh, this is also, we have macro simulations where we have you know, a simulated environment, but then we also have uh, more scopic or micro simulations where we're simulating uh, physical and, and, um, and visual elements. And then uh, digital assets. So the, if you're part of the Metaverse Standards Forum, digital assets may mean slightly something different, but uh, still close to the same thing. Um, 
here we we are talking more format metadata. Uh, you know, or is it USD or GLTF or that sort of effect? Um, and, and then the portability of digital assets, these are all you know, fairly important elements. So the last one I didn't touch on is artificial intelligence, which is the topic of today's uh, talk here. And fundamentally, the unique, unique element of AI here is that uh, AI actually can and does and will affect all of the other seven um, foundational interest groups. Uh, there are applications across all of these spaces, and we will uh, touch on those through today's presentation. <clears throat> so I'm going to take a quick stop on this uh, synthetic reality uh, slide here. So if you are familiar with the simulation hypothesis, or you, you believe the simulation hypothesis, or you're a, a follower of George Barclay, um, his immaterialism, or you particularly enjoy the matrix, uh, this is this concept of a faithful simulation of the real world, right? And all its elements, very atomic and, and quantum elements. Now, will the metaverse be synthetic reality? Um, I can't say, uh, but today that would be computationally impossible, right? Um, but it's kind of cool to think about the idea that maybe we have create this metaverse that is a synthetic reality and then becomes the reality for some downstream uh, society, right? Uh, but what I did want to touch on this, the reason why I wanted to touch on this is because of the concept of atomicity and composability. So when you look at things from the bottom up and you're able to create these fun foundational elements, uh, that will help facilitate the building of the metaverse, as opposed to making it very prescriptive and saying, okay, top down, <clears throat> this is what the experience is going to be, right? Is it going to be Roblox? Is it going to be Minecraft? Is it going to be this blockchain game? Th those are very prescriptive uh, methods, right? And that it doesn't embrace openness, it doesn't embrace interoperability. And so the, the point being that um, we need to be able to look at things from a bottom-up perspective so that we can build in, uh, build the metaverse effectively. Uh, the other thing I want to touch on was that those sort of the experiences today are very deterministic, right? Like you have programmatic rules. If we build the metaverse with a very stochastic element to it, we can then um, allow developers to then build in that space in a method that is not uh, constrained, right? And so that's that's the challenge right now that we face is to how can we build towards something that is truly open and and you know full stack uh, top to bottom. And so the this is the uh, wagon wheel of AI in the open metaverse. Um, there are there's certainly a lot here to cover and. Uh, but I do believe that AI will play the most significant role in the development and the operation of the metaverse. For something to be at such a huge scale, ultimately, um, human moderators cannot moderate something at that scale. Human moderators cannot moderate the internet today. And so we have this very powerful tool, um, and I believe that we only scrape the surface of what we can do. And some of the major innovations in, in the last you know, 10 years have really started to uh, culminate and, and get mainstream attraction, uh, particularly generative AI. Uh, and, and so you know, being able to generate new content from learned distributions is, is something very compelling. Um, and, and, and it's been around since the 80s, right? The, uh, the, you know, the restricted Boltzmann machine um, the work of Dr. Hinton, uh, but by 2014, Ian Goodfellow's paper had started to generate more and more interest in this space, and um, you know we're at the point now where, if you've seen you know Midjourney version five, you get some pretty photorealistic uh, outputs. Um, but over the course of the the last decade, we started to see generative images. We've started to be able to see generative text, speech, audio, video, and and now 3D digital assets are actually becoming more viable. So, but I do want to highlight that generative AI is not the only show in town, right? The, the metaverse, um, 
you know, you can imagine that uh, you know, it, the creation part is, is really compelling, but we have applications in fluid simulations. We have applications in fabric and hair simulations that can be done uh, with neural networks. And you know, s simulating uh, natural phenomena, uh, you know, facilitating scientific research and, and being more physically accurate than uh, many of the programmatic methods today. And so conversational AI is one of those elements too that you know, may be the de facto mechanism by which we interact with the metaverse, right? Um, you know, we may have these autonomous agents, our personal assistants that facilitate a lot of the activities that we do in, in, in the space for us. Um, but you know, the, the most method of interaction, these are all sort of elements that can be solved with, with uh, AI and, and uh, deep learning and reinforcement learning and so forth. Um, so, I move on. Yeah. so I do think that 3D asset creation, world building is going to be, at least initially, will be the very you know, primary activity in the metaverse, right? Uh, folks will be wanting to build their spaces. This you know, beckons back to like everybody jumping onto GeoCities and trying to create their own web page and, and this sort of thing, right? And so the, the metaverse will be incrementally uh, created over time. And um, you know, the workflows uh, that, that are in place today that are very procedural can be improved through the use of, of AI. Um, yeah, and so I, I would say one of the important innovations, at least in the last few years, in this space has been, uh, you know, uh, Milden Hall's and Tansik's paper on, on NERF. So being able to uh, effectively recreate 3D scenes and, and to, from 2D images inside this 5D coordinate space um, ha has proven to be pretty compelling. And although NERFs do suffer from uh, you know, long training times, uh, NVIDIA's Instant NERF really helped improve that. And I only see future improvements um, making this uh, much more accessible. Uh, we also have, um, and actually I want to stop for a sec. If, if anyone wants to ask a question while I'm on a slide, I, I'm happy to answer. Uh, so just throw your hand up. We're still a small enough group. So there are other aspects here that can be accomplished with neural networks. And we talk about like style transfer. So you may have a 3D asset of your avatar perhaps, and you're going, you have a photorealistic avatar and you go into a 3D, or sorry, you go into like Minecraft, let's say, and you apply Minecraft's style, or, uh, style transfer and you go into that space, and now you've matched that world's um, that world's style. Uh, 3D scene generation is is a little bit out of hand right now, right? It, it's not something that we're able to do. Uh, 3D asset generation is is still, um, you know, progressing, uh, and, and you know, Dream Fusion, Stable Dream Fusion is, is looking better these days, but uh, certainly it's not it's not fully there. Um, but I, I do think that there are really compelling reasons to apply AI in this space, and um, you know, there there are certainly boundless uh, applications. Uh, one of those is is the ability to move avatars between worlds, right? And so we want to be able to control these characters, and and so um, aside from autonomous agents, I'll jump on that in the next slide. The the necessity to interact with environments, you know, is a little bit uh, coarse when you you throw on a headset and you're kind of just pressing a controller and kind of moving around like this. Um, there are neural methods that that have shown that they can we can actually very well mimic human actions, right? And so uh, a particular interest is OpenAI's work with video pre-training. They you know, took Minecraft videos that are on YouTube. Uh, you know, taught a network to be able to um, replicate those movements, use some reinforcement learning to to fine tune, and then uh, take it took that um, those agents from the offline world and, and threw them into Minecraft to actually go and uh, execute tasks. And so I think the idea that we would only be moving around and 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 uh, in the metaverse, I think, uh, is probably naive because we 
have this ability to automate a lot of the, the tasks that we may want to do. Um, facial animation is another application that's pretty interesting. Uh, NVIDIA's audio to face, real time uh, analysis of audio and then being able to mimic facial movements as opposed to having to use sensors on your, your headset to be able to uh, analyze your facial movements. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're referring to being bound to the GPU, right? Yeah. Um, I think I haven't seen a paper recently that that, ta that illustrates that, but I, do, I don't think it's an NVIDIA solution is bound to GPU, but the, um, I do think that we're going to get there in terms of being able to do you know, full facial synthesis through um, audio analysis. Uh, I just don't know a paper right now off the top of my head that, that covers that. Can you give me an example of a timeline? <laughs> give you a timeline? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know because I'm not, I'm not involved in that research, right? It would be hard for me to surmise, right? Um, but yeah, certainly uh, we. This, this, may, this may not be a popular statement, but um, we need to move off of being bound to a particular vendor's hardware, right, in, in terms of openness. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, one vendor can't power the metaverse, right? Um, so the, the other thing is autonomous agents, right? And so there's some... There's been a lot of hype around it lately. I, having worked with autonomous agents, I don't really believe that these uh, auto GPT and, and uh, baby AGI and all this stuff are, are uh, and even like, um, I don't know, just this, uh, this chaining mechanism is, is really autonomous agents. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. I, I, I suspect that the metaverse will be filled with more autonomous agents than it will be with avatars, right? Um, and even when you exit the metaverse, you may disengage and allow your agent to take over your avatar and go do its, its thing, right? Um, now, that paper is exploiting the nature of language, right? It's using large language models to be able to kind of do this sort of communication. And I, I can't recall the paper, but there was one of maybe about three years ago where I, I want to say it was Meta um, had, had set up some agents and started, they started communicating with each other and then suddenly they're not talking English anymore, right? And they've, they've developed their own language, right? And um, it, it's very interesting stuff. Uh, um, yeah, certainly. <laughs> uh, but I do think autonomous agents, you know, there will be this convergence of personal assistants and autonomous agents and uh, I think the breeding ground right now is going to be the personal assistants, right? Like these highly, you know, hyper-personalized assistants that, I don't know if it's Clippy that comes back from the dead, but it's, it's very, um, you know, tailored to you, right? And, and your agent can go and then interact with other agents to get something accomplished, right? Like, why am I on uh, the phone with Comcast for like an hour and a half, right? Trying to, trying to figure something out. Let, let my agent go do it, so...
Yeah, I'm going to jump way ahead then. Um, so <clears throat> there, there are a huge number of concerns, right? I mean, every technology can be used for good, it can be used for bad. And uh, a lot of the challenges that we're going to face, we're going to face before the realization of the metaverse, right? We're with the, um, you know, I think Sam Altman is going to be speaking to Congress next Tuesday. Uh, and I'm very interested to see how that goes. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, there will be regulation, right? And uh, when will that happen? I'm not sure. I, I suspect sooner in the EU and UK before here. But, uh, you know, there has to be guardrails and there has to be consequences. Um, you know, you can't say my autonomous agent did it, right? And absolve yourself of any responsibility. And so the some of the things with, you know, the I'll kind of jump on this slide here. This is the, you know, basically looking at everything from a, an ethics lens for everybody that's involved in creation, in, in building, in research, in implementation of AI. Every AI system has to be uh, applied responsibility, responsibly and used responsibly, right? And so um, around the topic of autonomous agents, you know, human-centered and aligned is, is fairly important. You don't want uh, agents contravening uh, fundamental human rights and, and these sort of things. So, um, and, but my prediction, again, we're getting off a little bit off the metaverse space, but is that the uh, wide-scale usage of synthetic media and autonomous agents is going to create some serious problems, right? Um, perhaps in the next election. And so I think the reaction is going to be pretty um, stiff, but I don't know how you mitigate that. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, so whenever that topic comes up, uh, I get worried because I, I find, at least I am I am avid politics follower. I find any laws that are gonna get made are gonna get made by corporations because of the regulatory capture that they have. And if Sam Altman is going to go and talk to Congress, it's not because Sam Altman, the savior of humanity, is trying to make better laws for, you know, the world. It's because Sam Altman, the Y Combinator, you know, founder, is trying to make money and is trying to get regulatory capture for themselves. Um, so I, I get worried when talk of laws comes into this, something, you, know, you predict a problem and you make laws for it, like let's do minority report, why not we? Uh, I, so I, I wonder what your thoughts are on that, um, with, with making laws, what kind of laws? You talked about moderation, like, like, like what, is, is it truly a metaverse if, if people don't get to say, is it a walled garden or is it an interoperable open space, right? And right. the other thing was about the, uh, yeah, I think I'll sort of just leave it at that first. Like, okay. So there's two elements there. One is AI, the other is metaverse. I think the onus falls on virtual world operators to enforce good behavior in their virtual worlds, right? And so we've got these like applications of agents, you know, as, as gatekeepers, as moderators, as detectors of, of threats that, um, can enforce rules, they can enforce behaviors, right? Identify behaviors and pa through patterns and be able to um, mitigate that, right? Because human moderation is notoriously biased, uneven, and, and doesn't scale. So <clears throat> the, any, gov any legislation would have to then be enforced through you know, some similar mechanism in, in a virtual world. Now, are there gonna be virtual worlds that are totally lawless, like Silk Road virtual world? Probably, and, and obviously we have the law uh, to, you know, legal system to handle that, right? Now, um, because AI's reach is far beyond, you know, the metaverse, um, you asked about sort of big tech um, influence. And I think that's obvious by who was invited to uh, to speak to Kamala Harris last week, right? So th there isn't representation, but I do think that th there 
I do think that open source AI is, is, is gen, at least open source generative AI right now is a growing movement, right? LLMs are dropped on a daily basis. Uh, there's a lot of uh, activity in that space. You know, Stability has made a commitment to, to open source as well as trying to commercialize their own product. Um, and so at some point, uh, open source needs a voice, it needs a seat at the table, right? To say like, look, like, yeah, you've talked to these three big tech companies, but there, there's another community here, right? And so I think um, I might be getting too far down the rabbit hole and, and you know, sort of philosophical, and I know the open source community doesn't generally lobby, right? And, uh, but it, with AI, because it will be affected by regulation, we have to synthesize how we can um, convey our needs, right, uh, to, to legislators. Now, um, Stella from Eleuther uh, has already, you know, they've, they've provided some details to the EU and, and it looks, it sounds like they didn't follow their recommendations. And so, um, you know, traditionally, this kind of activity can be accomplished through through lobbying, but honestly, I, it's beyond my. Uh, I, I, I really love that. I, what you, is, I want to. I want to definitely get into the open source side of it, and I mean the perhaps at a later point. I don't want to interrupt this, but just quickly to emphasize on the point of the laws. Like I feel like uh, my personal. I've been going around like being you know very vocal about to people that I talk to. Uh, like I, I'm, I'm saying, let's not get crazy about lawmaking with this stuff because. If there are, if first of all, if people get in a frenzy about let's make laws to prevent something, the laws are not going to get made to prevent the thing that you think you want to prevent. Right. What, what it's going to give people is a mandate to be able to make laws, and then the, the laws that are going to get made are the laws that they want to make, which is corporations being the they. And so I, I feel like I'm generally make, trying to make people skeptical of law lawmaking needed here. So uh, to, the, to that point, I'm trying to understand what laws don't exist right now that would need to be created for this. Like if you if you murder someone through an in, in, through an electronic means, you know that is still you doing the murder. If there's you know, what laws do we do we need to make for autonomous agents? I'm trying to understand why would there need to be another law if you do harass someone, for example, and you're doing it through electronic means, whether it's a metaverse or whether it's an email or scam or whatever. Right. There are already laws on the table. I feel yeah. like I get I'm worried about the law making because people people get a you know thing about like well let's make new laws to prevent this. What right. new laws? What new laws are needed? What can you think of as right. a law that needs to be done? And you know what and what about laws that they're gonna make to out outlaw any open source model? Right. Like GPU clusters are now tra being tracked like terrorist cells. I'm making a meme basically, but you know what I'm trying to say. Sure. Like, like yeah. they're gonna try and do anything they can to keep that moat if you you know if you're following the discourse. Right. So I'm trying to understand what laws what laws need to be made that aren't already there. Yeah. So the one, the sort of the idiosyncrasy here is that um, today, if I, let's say I'm a scammer and I'm using an auto dialer and I'm, you know, calling tons of numbers, right, waiting for somebody to pretend to claim their Amazon hundred dollar gift card, um, versus using agents, right, autonomous agents to go and 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 conduct that. There's obvious scale using uh, uh, automation to be able to to affect that, and I mean, you could be talking to an agent, not autonomous agent, and not even know it, right? It's on the other side of that phone. The, ultimately, it's accountability, and I do think that the laws on the books cover that today, right? Is, okay, well, you've launched all these agents, right? Um, now, here's the caveat, which is to say that there's emergent properties, right? Like, that I told the agent to go Ordered groceries and it went and you know told somebody that you know, something that affected their life, right? So um, that liability, right? But I think ultimately accountability has to be with the operator. And where I do see that gray space is that when agents are let loose, right? And and now let's say they've become untethered, then you know. It, we kind of miss this whole property of controllability, right? Like, you have to be able to control the technology, and if it isn't controllable, how do you hold anyone accountable for it, right? Is it the developer, the researcher that came up with the model architecture? Is it like, you know, the last person to touch that agent? I don't know, but um, I, I do think that's going to be uh, a topic that needs to be addressed in the future, right? I don't think we're there yet. Like, even if you look at um, like Langchain and, and doing some of these things, 
Uh, you can set the you know GPT-4 wild to do a few stuff, but I, th I think that's what I'm trying to parse out is uh, if you start an agent. First of all, it's on the person using the tool to be accountable for the tool. Obviously, like you can use a hacksaw and use it to get it, cut a tree or do something else. It's a tool, and if it's, it's a broken tool and it misfires or something, that's also on you. A gun is not. So it, I think with the LLMs, they're you know black boxes, and we need to learn more. But I'm trying to understand, the, like, is this? Are we trying to create laws to say? Because already, I'm. I, this is my opinion. If, if you're gonna do that, if you're going to launch an agent, let's say baby AGI, and it goes ahead and fraud, you know, fraudulent does something, I'm sure the law is going to be like, well, you created, you did fraud, let's go, you know, go to go to jail. So are we trying to create laws to prevent people from going to jail, or are we trying to create laws to put people in jail? Because mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure the laws that are going to get made are going to be laws to put people in jail, not some law that says, hey, it wasn't this person, so all it was Mera, uh, Lama, that had a mistake in their weights, and so actually someone at Mera is now accountable. I very much doubt that. My, my feeling is, if a law is going to get made, it's going to get made to put more people in jail, or prevent people from being able to do research or whatever. Right. So I, I'm going to understand from your point, because because you didn't you didn't you don't seem like someone who's wary of laws. You you seem like it's probably it's going to happen. It needs to happen at some point. And so yeah. I'm trying to get some sense of from some real law that needs to be made, some real policy that yeah. needs to be enforceable. What, what do you mean, rape in the metaverse? Rape? How do you do it in a metaverse? Rape? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no. I, I, I know, I know, I, I know the article you talk about, but, I'm, but, I, yeah. But, but, but I'm exactly. I'm bringing up exactly those things. Is people are talking about this ephemeral space, this digital space, as like I got harassed in the metaverse or rape in the metaverse? But it's not. It was an, it's a digital. It's a computer. Right. Can we, can we talk about things separately and so that everything doesn't get diluted? Yeah, um, I think so. Obviously, all that stuff will play out in the courts, right? Like, ultimately, they make those decisions. I don't think that we're going to see any laws on the books anytime soon with respect to that, right? And I think um, the only thing I would say to, to kind of wrap that up is that we, as stewards of, of the metaverse and you know, developers, have to act responsibly, right? And, and anticipate the possible abuses of what, uh, what we create, right? So I think we are, actually, does anyone have the time? I just want to make sure to see where we are at here. 12.30, okay. So we got about 15 minutes, I think. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on image generation. Uh, it's pretty ubiquitous now. Uh, you know, for PBR materials, there's some applications here, you know, integrating into your workflow, do some auto generation of color, roughness, and metalness maps, these sort of things. Um, it, it, it's all you know, text guided. I think where uh, we move in this space is that the, instead of one shot generation is, you know, we have to like control net to be able to do some guidance. But I think now in the metaverse, it becomes a little bit more interactive, right? Being able to uh, iteratively uh, create your outcome, right? And so uh, I don't want to dismiss anything with images because I do think there's probably going to be a very flourishing art community and that may be AI art, it may be human art, and we talk about this idea of authenticity and how are we going to be able to differentiate between what's generated by AI, what's generated by people. Um, I do see a possible use for you know, distributed ledger technology in that space to be able to assert authenticity. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, there are applications. The one I do want to uh, stop on, because I think it's going to be fairly pervasive, and before we get to the metaverse, it will, will be pervasive, is this concept of hyper-personalization. And so being, you know, today we can understand consumers and users fairly well. Um, with hyper-personalization, we're able to more accurately model human behavior, right? And I don't know if you've seen some of the, like, interactions with some of these large language models is, you know, you're able to actually, you know, do pseudo-reasoning through language to be able to discern uh, you know, what product is this person going to buy, right, based on prior activity. And now we've got this hyper-personalization, which will tailor content to a particular user, right? And so being able to do that in real time, um, you know, creating an experience, right, inside the metaverse where it's 
highly tailored to you dynamically based on your preferences. And um, the applications outside of the metaverse are certainly in like video generation, like kind of be watching Netflix and have like you know a different uh, outcome or different ending in that film based on my preferences, right? Now I like that film even more. So hyper-personalization has a lot of applications in content generation and in, um, in marketing and advertising. And so I, I do think that's going to be more pervasive. It's kind of got that minority report type um, situation. So one of the neat spaces is, is in using neural networks is in simulations. And so we've got these you know, physics-based and, and visual simulations. And they can be synthesized right with uh, neural networks. So we've got like rigid body physics. Um, you know, it's fairly uh, low computational overhead, but there are there have been some really promising papers on uh, emulating rigid body physics with uh, neural networks. And so using deep learning. Um, you're able to outperform mathematical models. And there was one particularly interesting paper from uh, Stanford and the University of Oxford, uh, a technique called DENSE, that was able to accelerate these simulations by billions of times, which is just, you know, um, just is pretty incredible. And so for cloth simulations, for, um, you know, soft body uh, physics, uh, there's these, um, same applications in neural networks being able to train on, let's say, the output of a, um, you know, for instance, there's this one paper called Neural Cloth Simulation. And it was able to learn from the outputs of Maya's N-Cloth uh, physics solver how to accur accurately predict how soft, like, cloth would behave, right? And it's able to do that with um, 5,000 times less computational uh, resource requirements. Right, it's doing inference to be able to um, emulate that, which is, the training is expensive. It's the inference that is relatively cheap. Um, all right. So maybe less, uh, I mean, this is becoming a little bit more pervasive with a lot of these uh, you know, new uh, platforms that you can synthesize speech and you know, obviously, the media kind of hypes it up, and people are being, you know, held ransom and from a few samples of their voice. But um, you know, DeepMind produced a paper, WaveNet, uh, that was released in 2016, and it's it demonstrated early on that uh, you know, generative AI can be used effectively to generate different forms of audio, right? So speech, music. Um, it can work with waveforms, it can work with MIDI, and, and these methods uh, can be broadly applied, right? And so we have like OpenAI's MuseNet, uh, that came out a few years ago, um, can produce like four minute, four, or sorry, like four minute musical compositions that have 10 distinct in instruments and it's guided by text, right, effectively. Uh, you know, there, there's Music LM was just released January, I wanna say. Um, by Google Research, and uh, it can generate several minutes of like 24 kilohertz, uh, you know, audio from 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 strictly from text uh, input, and you know, there's also Whisper, I think, which uh, OpenAI released. You know, that's um, is trained on 60 680,000 hours of multilingual, multitask supervised data, and has some you know pretty impressive outputs. So I think the, the use cases here are pretty broad, right? Uh, in the metaverse, it's an, an audio experience. You wanna be able to, um, you know, be able to move through virtual worlds, but not have to effectively go in when you build a virtual world to prescribe all of the audio effects that are gonna happen in that world. And so the, there's, um, there's been some other papers that have been able to take video and generate sound effects from the video without any guidance, uh, which is pretty impressive. 
And so I think there's a lot of applications here because I do think that uh, the metaverse will be a very, you know, um, uh, an experience where we're using voice more than mechanical means like keyboards to be able to interact with the, the space around us. And just a quick stop on um, you know, other multimedia. I don't want to uh, skip over this. Their uh, large language models are quite capable of, of producing text that will only get better. Uh, model sizes are going to reduce, get smaller. Model architectures are going to change. Um, you know, the days of the large language model, as Sam Altman uh, has put it, are, are done. Uh, I, would, I believe that already. I think that uh, we, once we move off this transformer architecture and, and, or enhance it, uh, we can get away with ha having uh, smaller models that are more portable. And the open source community is already starting to produce these things. Uh, uh, although Llama is not fully open source, um, a lot of its derivatives are, like Open Llama and um, you know, GPT-J as well. Uh, these are all uh, accessible models that, that we can use with uh, smaller parameter counts. So commerce, this is where we, we can sort of leverage this concept of AI smart contracts. So as opposed to writing procedural contracts, uh, procedural smart contracts, we, in a decentralized environment, you can use these AI smart contracts that are effectively models, and they're going to um, perform some function, right? And so if we look at uh, you know, a, a smart contract that may release funds uh, after 1,000 widgets has been sold and those widgets have been, you know, the delivery has been verified, we can use a model to, to effectively uh, achieve that outcome. Whereas uh, you know, procedural code can uh, effectively do that, but there, the code will, the, because models generalize better than code, we're able to look at outside elements, right? Like look at potential like, you know, uh, transaction behavior and other things that might be indicators of fraud and be able to flag that and uh, hold up transactions. So I, I did um, spend some time on the hyper-personalization. I think that's gonna be a big deal. Uh, search and discovery, so in the metaverse, I mean, finding anything is probably going to be uh, fairly difficult. And having you know, current search and discovery methods probably not going to scale, especially in decentralized environments. And so we have to look at alternatives using uh, artificial intelligence that can um, help us locate what we need, whether that's people, whether that's product, whatever. Um, so we did skip forward to this earlier. Uh, I'll cover the right side because we covered the left. The you know, authenticity in the metaverse, so who, who are you, right? How can I verify um, your credentials? And things like voice pattern recognition and uh, I don't know if you, I think Sam Altman, I keep saying his name, which is bugging me. Um, but, you know, the world coin and, and the debacle with that, that you had to, like, authenticate yourself with, like, some biomechanism, um, that might be a little too much for, for, for folks. But uh, certainly, you know, deep learning can, can do a lot of these, um, you know, authenticity checks. We also want to be concerned about health of, of users in the metaverse, right? And so if somebody is spending too much time in the metaverse or their, uh, their behavior is irrational, um, we may want to be concerned about that, right? And, and, and flag uh, a user early on. And accessibility, so being able to do, you know, maybe text to braille or being able to um, do real-time language translation. These sort of things can all be affected with, with deep learning. So I know we kind of jumped around in this slide deck, so I'm going to go back to the benefits here. So AI does have some significant benefits, right? Uh, aside from things like we talked about, like computational requirements uh, at, at runtime, 
we have these lower barriers to entry, right? Uh, if I want to um, create a 3D model, I'm not so good at that, right? And so I'm not gonna be able to create avatars, I'm not gonna be able to sell these things, but through the use of generative AI, you can create these avatars, you can create assets, and you can do it very um, friction, in a very frictionless manner. Uh, we also have this idea of reduction of human error and, and sort of a more impartial application, especially when we talk about um, moderating environments. And uh, you know, continuity, right? Like AI doesn't sleep, so we can maintain continuity on a 24-7 basis. We, let's say we need customer service inside the metaverse, I shouldn't have to wait forever. Um, deploy my agent, have them resolve the issue with another agent, and then come back with some outcome. And I do, I do see a possibility for, with the metaverse, to reduce barriers, not just reduce bar barriers to entry for creation, but also uh, create opportunities for economic growth, right? Let people that perhaps don't have, um, you know, $4,000 a year to spend on Maya, right? Or they don't have a laptop that's particularly well uh, suited for, for creation. Um, to be able to interact with these virtual worlds and be able to create things and monetize what they want to monetize. And I'm just kind of, we're short on time, so I'm kind of skimming through. Um, there are a lot of risks, right? Uh, you know, the misuse of, of AI, we've talked about, you know, that issue as well as autonomous agents and being able to, to uh, amplify harms, right, uh, at scale. Uh, privacy and security and safety models train on data, lots of data and uh, unfortunately PII data can sometimes leak into that and, and um, you know, the bias, bias and discrimination. So bias in data, bias in models, and bias from unintended outcomes is, is a challenge. Um, the big one I, I see is misinformation and manipulation. I mean, humans are doing it pretty well today. Uh, with AI, it's amplified. And so we need to be very cognizant to the fact that uh, that will have an effect on, on, on people. Um, you know, governance and accountability. So where does this responsibility lie, right, when, when somebody is harmed? Um, Addiction and overuse, certainly going to be an issue. Uh, you know, um, and, and power imbalances, right? So AI is already creating an power imbalance. Certain companies have more power because they have more ability and more, uh, you know, an economic position to be able to train bigger models and, and be able to, um, you know, execute on those and manage them. So do we want to be, uh, do we want to be held uh, to, to using someone's particular black box, or do we want to have the freedom to be able to use our own, our own models and have access to open source? Um, yeah, and job displacement. I, I think that, you know, that's a, sometimes a nice name of saying lost jobs, right? Uh, we have to uh, understand that if we use AI as a tool, we, we can, you know, maintain continuity. If we treat it as an adversary, uh, then, and you don't want to embrace it, then generally like every technology that's come before it, you end up losing out, right? And so we have to understand that there are, there are, um, there would be impact to the economy. And then the unintended consequences is really like a catch-all for like, I didn't expect it to do that because I don't know how the model behaves, right? I don't know why it's doing what it's doing. So if I look at the landscape right now, I, this, like, move, this trend towards foundational models I think is not going to succeed long term. I think we have these open source models that are, are starting to become more accessible. I see a community growing larger around that sort of paradigm. And um, yeah, we, we won't be using Anthropics and, and OpenAI's models to do everything that we need to do, right? 
will have access to community-based models and uh, models that are capable of running on you know, a smartphone, right, eventually. And so um, I, I do see that we're, we'll move away from that black box, the opaque sort of like uh, I'm relying on some third party to, to um, provide that service. Now, will that totally go away? No. I mean, that's a good model for a lot of companies that want to be able to have something that's reliable in the cloud and they don't want to host it in-house. But uh, the community, I think, uh, the generative AI community is, is more and more embracing open source. And I think as that momentum builds and the community comes together, that it'll become stronger. And I think that's where consumers have choice, right? And, and um, can make their decision for themselves. So we kind of, we did go through this. Um, can anyone do a time check? I don't know, we're two minutes, okay. All right, S should I wrap it up and then we do questions or, okay. The only thing I w else I want to drop here was, this is something I put together a few years ago. It's the Metaverse Code of Ethics. Um, it's actually based on, loosely based on the ACM's Code of Ethics and uh, it, I mean, it's in the presentation if you want to have a look at it, but it basically is guidance for those that are responsible for building the technology that will create the metaverse to, for us to live, build things responsibly, right? And, and um, you know, that's effectively it and uh, a shameless plug on my upcoming book.